This is the Defenders Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about Echo Season 1, Episode 3, Tuklo. What did you do? No, Maya brought this on herself coming home. All I did was accelerate the process. You called someone. Yeah, well, here's the thing, Henry. I ain't taking orders no more. Not from you. Still a chance for you to get out of this alive. You really think he's going to pay you and then just let you walk out of here? If I was you, Henry, I would have turned her in myself. Collect that bounty. You left it up for grabs, and I'm grabbing. Welcome back, fellow Defenders, to the Defenders Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're halfway through Echo Season 1, talking about Episode 3, Too Glow. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow Defenders. I am one of your other hosts, John. And much like Cousin Biscuits in this episode, <laughs> um, Chris, unfortunately, isn't available to join us for this one. No, exactly. Yeah, so or just... much like Grace, one of uh, Vicky's uh, gang, uh, mm-hmm. slinked off to the car park. <laughs> Ran off to the car I've park. got to get something out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Very smart way of getting out of uh, yeah, that situation, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I did like that. Yeah, it's quite cool, quite cool. Uh, yeah, but of course, we're going to talk about the third episode of Echo in full spoiler-filled detail. I uh, hope you're watching along with us uh, as we go through the season of Echo in a weekly podcast. Uh, we know it was all released on the uh, 12th of January, but uh, a lot more a lot more fun to talk about these on a weekly basis, isn't it? Exactly, and better for all time management. Well, definitely, definitely. It's certainly uh, good to sort of roll with this and... Uh, do it one week at a time. Exactly, exactly. It feels like, uh, as we as we said before, like the way we started doing Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and Iron Fist and Defenders, all those Netflix shows back in the day that all got released in one day and we uh, spent seven or eight weeks going through uh, episodes that everybody'd seen in one day when they binged them. <laughs> so it oh, yeah. feels quite similar to that. It's also been a massively busy weekend with lots and lots of stuff to fill up our time with. Uh, got uh, The Last of Us 2 got its uh, upgrade, so I've been playing that on the PlayStation 5. Very cool looking. Very good. Yeah, getting back into The Last of Us. Uh, the Creator's just been released on... Uh, on uh, Disney Plus. Disney Plus, yep. Yeah. yep. So uh, lots and lots of stuff. And of course, Percy Jackson, uh, which we've been watching every week as well. Yes, Percy Jackson. Mm-hmm. Um, and Enjoying that a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah it's been really good fun, yeah. hasn't it? I love the movies of that. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the TV show is um, significantly better than the movies for me. I'm really enjoying it a lot more than I enjoyed the movies. Okay, excellent. Yeah, but that was good. of course, we're not here to talk about that, though. We are here to talk about uh, Echo. But I do want to talk about a quick bit of news that we heard just yesterday uh, about an upcoming show uh daredevil born again is finally going back into production yeah uh, yeah so that's awesome and secondly the big announcement really for us as a big fan of the daredevil tv show is that philip silveri is coming back the stunt coordinator for the original three seasons of daredevil uh, heavily involved in those awesome action sequences that we got through daredevil being pretty much replicated here in echo but philip silveri coming back to join yeah. the, the team behind uh, daredevil born again that's really cool they must have realized somewhere in the higher ups uh of Disney uh, that uh, the absolute unrequented love for these street level heroes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think they know their audience as well. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. And I did see uh, Chio Coker, who's the creator of uh, Luke Cage, commenting on the fact that uh, after Echo being part of the Defenders world now that loads more people are checking out those shows again. So it's brought in a brand new audience for uh, the Daredevil and, and uh, well, all the Netflix shows. Uh, Fantastic. Guess, so, which yeah. is really cool. It is really yeah. good. Really good. Exactly what you would have hoped Superb. for. From, from um, not yeah. only have we been going back through uh, Daredevil season one, mm-hmm. but also we started on... Uh, Jessica Jones season yes. one, and you just realize how good, um, you know, the principal casting for mm-hmm. these shows, like Christian Ritter is excellent, so as well as David Tennant then oh. as Kilgrave, just a fantastic kind of, um, creepiness to that first season. Yeah, absolutely. And I forgot, um, how much balls it took for him to use the David Tennant doctor accent the doctor who accent yeah. that he used for that as the evil villain kilgrave in that show he's so good but the minute you hear that voice you're going hang on a second is the tardis somewhere near here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. it's kind of hard to take him uh, seriously as a bad guy and then he is a really bad guy in that show so uh, excellent stuff uh, one final um thing i want to say before we go into this episode uh, just a correction on uh, one of the the uh, comments that we made a couple of weeks ago i think chris was talking about in the first episode that he'd heard uh, mark bernardin and kevin smith talking about echo production for the show 
I think he mentioned that Mark Bernardin was saying there was supposed to be nine episodes in the season, but confirmed now originally for this show it was supposed to be six episodes like the other live action shows and then was cut down to five so that they could fit everything in. You know, one of the things we've talked about throughout this season of Echo is all of the flashbacks to earlier times, you know, these massive moments in the history of, of of the US. So I guess with those big moments and the big action sequences, um, it's probably quite a expensive production to do. So uh, so they cut it down to five episodes from six, which makes a lot more sense because cutting down from nine episodes to five would be a huge uh, cut. Yeah, well, it's much, yeah, much bigger. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So just wanted to correct that because we'd said that earlier yeah. on in the, in the podcast so and has now been, uh, been confirmed. Uh, also, there are the making of... Um, Echo coming out on the 31st of January, um, which will be available in Disney Plus as well, which we're looking forward to seeing because, uh, again, um, the scale, I suppose, of the show and, and uh, those historical moments uh, really want to delve deep into that. So I hope the, yeah. the documentary that they do for that is going to be really good. No, exactly, exactly. Uh, first off, before we get into our episode details and, of course, our spoiler-filled discussion for Echo Episode 3, Tuklo, if you are new to uh, TV podcast industries or the Defenders podcasts, please mm-hmm. pop on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com where you can subscribe to any podcast player of your choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are also over on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries. Yes, and for the feedback on all things to do with Echo mm-hmm. uh, for each uh, of the episodes, please send your emails to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Absolutely. We want to hear your thoughts, especially if you're if you're new to TV Podcast Industries as well. Welcome to our 10th anniversary year. Uh, we should say that to anybody well, who's yeah. listening uh, for the first time to, to Echo. Uh, lots and lots of podcasts available over on tvpodcastindustries.com, including, as I mentioned earlier on, all of the Netflix shows, uh, which we covered as they were coming out at the time. Uh, but John, let's get into our discussion about this episode of Echo. Yeah, Derek, what are some of the episode details? Who gave us what, when, where, how, and why? Well, of course, the character of Echo was created by David Mack and Joe Quesada. Uh, the head writer for the show is Marion Dare. Uh, the teleplay for this episode was was written by Marion Dare and Ken Christensen, who we mentioned on a previous episode. Uh, the story for this episode was written by Ken Christensen, Jason Gavin, and Shoshana Stern. Uh, Jason Gavin was nominated for multiple times at the WGA Awards for his work on Friday Night Lights and also wrote on Roswell, New Mexico, and Dark Winds as well. We mentioned Dark Winds uh, as there was another writer on that show uh, earlier on in the season as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I had a few dark winds as well last night <laughs> after the curry. <laughs> oh dear, John. Oh dear. I don't think that's what that shows no, okay. at all. Um, and the other writer here, Shanna Stern, was the co-creator and writer of her own show, This Close, which she was also the co-star of as well. Uh, she's excellent. also an actor in multiple episodes of Supernatural and Weeds, two of her favorite shows. Yeah, John. excellent stuff. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Weeds. Love yeah. this. Love Such that a good show. show. Yep. Yeah. And Supernatural, of course. Mm-hmm. And this episode was directed by Katrina McKenzie. Katrina is an indigenous Australian director with tons of TV credits for shows including The Walking Dead, Supernatural, oh, yeah. and Mythic Quest. Uh, she's directing an episode in season four of The Boys as well, one of the other biggest shows we have on TV Podcast Industries. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Welcome, Katrina, to The Boys. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, looking is. forward to some ultra violence uh, in The Boys as well, given this episode. Katrina's obviously got a handle on uh, on doing violent uh, uh, fighting sequences, so yeah. uh, probably see a bit more of that in The Boys. Uh, season 4 coming later this year as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for Echo, episode 3, Tuklo? Sure. In the late 1800s, Tuklo practices shooting with her father, one of the light horsemen. Despite wanting to be a light horseman, her father forbids this because she is a woman. Tuklo's father rides out to confront some local criminals while Tuklo braids her hair like a Choctaw warrior. She receives a vision of Shafra and Loak, and her hands begin to glow. The criminals ambush Tuklo's father, but she hears the attack and r- arrives in time to save him and his group of light horsemen. Scully is visited by Chula, who encourages her to reach out to Maya so that she doesn't lose her granddaughter. Elsewhere in Tamaha, Maya receives a sudden vision and warning from Chaffa, Loak, and Tuklo, but is ambushed and captured by Vicky. Vicky and his associates, Bridget and Grace, hold both Maya and Henry hostage at Henry's bowling alley, having tipped off Zane about Maya's location. As they wait to hand Maya over to Zane and retrieve the bounty reward, they also have to subdue and capture Bonnie after she shows up to ask Henry about the rumours uh, that Maya has returned home. 
Bonnie is held with Maya, and the two of them awkwardly confront each other's absence from their lives as they seek an escape plan from their predicament. Zayn arrives for Maya, betraying and killing Vicky. Before he's able to get hold of Maya, she escapes and attacks Zane's men, but fails to get the upper hand as Zane threatens Bonnie and Henry. As he holds Maya at gunpoint, preparing to shoot her and Henry, he receives a phone call, prompting Zane and his men to leave. Maya sends Bonnie away, promising to reconcile with her later, but learns from Henry the shocking revelation that Fisk is still alive. Henry takes up Maya's previous offer and promises to help her in her war with Fisk, while Scully gives Maya a new prosthetic and a new look for her prosthetic. But as Maya returns home, her one-eyed nightmare Fisk confronts her. <sighs> silently confronts her. Very silently, yeah. yes. I was waiting for a Maya, you know, I was waiting for that. Yeah, something like that. But I also felt like th- that moment of all things, that kind of, you know... That traditional standoff in a mm-hmm. Western, yep. uh, you know, silent but deadly mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. And I think sort of the bookend with the silent film opening is kind of interesting. Yeah, so I, like, I, I understood why, you know, in these moments or decisions mm-hmm. of should he say something here or, or not, I can see why they went with or a choice was made whether it was the actor or Mm -hmm. the writer or you know whatever and that they would go with the silent uh but deadly uh treatment you know the unspoken threat absolutely and i I think i suppose that that works really well for echo as well because the show has used silence and noise uh in various ways throughout the show uh so i think that makes sense a good one john um let's get into our top five fight points for the episode our big moments uh from the episode uh overall though must say this is one of my favorite episodes the show so far it's been really really good in fact it might be my favorite uh, i know good, episode yeah. one had the big moments where we got the return of daredevil we got kingpin in there so those are big showy uh moments but i think this episode there's lots going on there's lots of stuff with the characters um love the opening and uh, and loved uh the massive fight sequence uh in the episode as well so i think overall uh this has been my favorite so far yeah, no, I really enjoyed this uh, episode as well. It, it felt really good. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, no, I think that, I think so far this series has been really solid. Really I've good, really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But shall we get on to our fight point number one? Absolutely. Turklo and the Light Horseman. Yeah, I thought this was a really, really interesting opening. Not just because it reveals another ancestor, but because of the way it was put together. You know, yeah. in the la- in the last two episodes, we've had the ancestor of of Chaffa and of Loak, um, and we've seen their introductions kind of filmed as if we're following the characters, I suppose. Whereas yeah. here, while we're still following the character, we're seeing it as if it's being uh, sh- shown through a 1950s silent movie or a 1940s silent movie, yeah. um, which was a really interesting choice. And it made me really think about the difference in cinema over the course of the last 100 years. You know, cinema started out, obviously, as a, as a silent medium where um, images projected on screen. You had the dialogue showing up. Um, only in text and then you had a piano playing over the back for the audience to just get the excitement of the uh, of the movie um which is really interesting when you think about the fact that echo is is hearing impaired you know that she's that she's a deaf character and she would have been able to enjoy a movie like this back in the 20s and 30s whereas now everything is around the dialogue right so yeah. uh, and most movies aren't subtitles unless you go to specific showings in the cinema so uh, what a difference that is and what a great choice to make here to do it as a silent movie uh, all the way through to the end uh, where we have the reveal of Tuklo being a very powerful um, warrior a Choctaw warrior and the silence is broken by her father as she frees them from um, from the the surprise attack. Effectively, he breaks it with the cheer. Effectively, um, announcing her as a, a Choctaw warrior is what it came across to me as. I love yeah. that it was silent all the way up to that point when you hear the war cry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I think you're right. I think having this moment of um, you know, the medium through which we watch um, because cinema back in in you know the the late. 19th century Mm -hmm. was the the tv room it was the living room for people people had to go out to see these they didn't have home television so it was the television of its time people went to see and get news from it Mm -hmm. um and as well as movies and so you know having it done in the black and white silent format Mm -hmm. is 
a because it's of that time, but yeah. also it just links in so well to the fact that the, you know the lead character here is deaf mm-hmm. and, and needs to sign, has to deal with uh, you know written word on screen yeah. as well. So. I thought this was really well done, and as yeah. you say, then it being broken with sound mm. by the arrival of of Tuklo, um here, and I, I kind of liked how you know Tuklo ultimately has these massive skills, another ancestor, mm-hmm. but it's skills in this very new technology for that time as well, which is the gun. Well, yeah. uh, and I really kind of liked uh, that idea, you know, um, this kind of sharpshooter uh, wants to sort of follow in the footsteps of her father, mm-hmm. but ultimately because she's a woman, it's not seen as being appropriate for her, for her to do. I mean, I, I like the fact that she says, what use is there in me in, in creating life if I can't protect it as well? Yes. Which you do. To give uh, life means nothing if I can't you know, protect it. Yeah, I really like that. So you know, really, really good. Yeah, and then her father's telling her that you, women are life givers, not life takers. Yeah, and, and I, yeah. I love then that you have just the acceptance mm-hmm. of and uh, you know the ability for um Tuklo's father to be completely adaptable and flexible in the moment sees her coming to the rescue of him and his, his other uh, band of light horsemen in this ambush you yeah. know after being ambushed and um d- gives the war cry uh, to to as you say I think that's good I hadn't really thought of it mm. but it, it makes sense because she's also braided her hair we see yes. that and yeah. um, so that she becomes um, a Choctaw warrior who says yeah. that the braids are just for the warriors and effectively you also see the line from her where she's saying well if they won't accept me as I am they'll see me as I am as she braids her hair like yeah. Choctaw warriors it's really cool um, and, and you know one other thing about, about this scene as well um, I think we mentioned in the synopsis that she hears the attack she doesn't she gets the warning um, so she's in the water and she sees the spiral pool that we saw from the first yeah. episode with Chaffa and then she gets the visions just like Maya does uh, later on in the episode um, she gets the visions and realizes something's happening so again this uh, ancestral warning a warning call coming from the women of the Choctaw Nation the ancestors uh, throughout history that are able to warn and empower um, uh, Tukla here yeah absolutely yeah. And, and again I'm loving this opening of seeing you know the Choctaw nation throughout the different periods of time and mm-hmm. I love the fact that you know e- even just with that that the final episode being Maya is her joining those ranks of, of these fierce uh, Choctaw warrior women yeah. and yeah. you know creators protectors whatever mm-hmm. and they're like i think that's really really interesting and it's such a great choice yeah. to have that and to link this through um with, with echo so absolutely love this uh opening for yeah. me yeah i do also want to mention of course um obviously checking this out as as we've seen the episode the white horsemen um are, are real uh, characters are real people um, in existence. The, uh, the the each of the five major uh, indigenous people in in the US were able to have their own. I, I suppose uh, mounted police force called the Light Horsemen. So each of the major tr- major uh, tribes, including okay, uh, yeah. the Choctaw, uh, had their own Light Horsemen that, that patrolled and had the right to uh, arrest and prosecute uh, people who were going against the um, the laws and rules of the nation. So um, so really good. That, again, they were drawing from real historic. Um, people uh, so they can tell this story within Echo so uh, I think that was really cool yeah absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. Uh, anything else about Tukla or the Light Horseman John uh, no uh, not for me I think uh, just a little segue point I think into our fight point too because I love how you know with the end of this opening sequence how it cuts to Chula in black and white on the security camera fo- footage That's, yeah, yeah. going into uh, Scully's pawn shop mm-hmm. like I, I just think that's a really nice little choice here yeah. um, you know back in the modern day but in black and white and ultimately silent as well because generally the security cameras are silent absolutely um, yeah. they just capture the image uh, so I think to fight point two Ch- uh, Chula and uh, well, she needs to get a bit of color into her uh, mm-hmm. after that little segue point, but also uh, she needs to listen. Yeah, um, yeah. I really enjoyed these interactions between Trula and Scully here. Yeah. I felt it was like, you know, two adults used to, you know, be an item, used to be 
uh, a couple yeah, we, we kind find of they've fallen out. out. And I, I think that yeah. was something that was certainly confirmed here as to their relationship, yeah, you know, what its status was. Yeah. Um, but one where they can still find, you know, obviously didn't seem to be any kind of bad breakup, it, mm-hmm. you know, and they're still able to have um, solace, advice, you know, discuss things out with this you know, between one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of, I kind of just really enjoyed this interaction. It felt yeah. really just adult, actually. Yeah. And yeah. I think Graham normal. Green's also having a lot of fun. Oh, definitely. Uh, in, in the scene. It's interesting, isn't it? When you kind of piece all together the story that's behind it, they don't really underline it too much, but, um, effectively Chula is, um, Maya's grandmother. But yes. he isn't. Scully is not her grandfather. No. And he, he talks about Chula losing her daughter, and that's what happened to her. He doesn't, it isn't his daughter that he lost. So no. uh, that's why he's, I suppose, maintaining more of a relationship with other members of the family. He didn't have that loss. It's Chula that had that loss. But I do love in the conversation when he comes in uh, speaking in, in Choctaw and speaking in Indian, where he says to her, you used to melt like butter when I spoke in Indian. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, he's still, still massively horny. Well, that's it. <laughs> he's, he's still trying his tricks, you know, yeah. to kind of woo her in a absolutely. sense, you know. The, the, sitting the, beside the, her on the tiny couch going, cheekiness. well, I have a back problem, uh, so it's much much more comfortable to have beside me here. Yeah, and she's having none that, of it. Yeah. That's it. It's that cheekiness. But but then also, you know, you can sense that Trula is this sort of real, um, you know, strong woman in this community, mm. you know, has the respect of others. Yeah. Um, it, you know, is, is, is the wise sage lady mm-hmm. of the community or one of them. And yet Scully, because of their previous relationship, has that shorthand, doesn't necessarily have some of the reverence. And I like how he just, defends Maya here and gives her a few home truths that, you know, well, you don't even know her. She, you know, left so um, young, Mm -hmm. you know, and you say you want to protect, but you lost your daughter. And if you're not careful, you'll lose um, your, your granddaughter as well and swallow your pride before you, you lose her. Yeah. Um, And it's, I just love that kind of, you know, hard hitting, honest, just conversation that Scully has with her, yeah, um, and she has no com- she she knows that he knows her. At, that there's kind of just this understanding between them, which is really kind of unspoken. And I really, really liked it. Yeah, absolutely, really, and it really came across. It did. I guess is the the important part. It did uh, about that as yeah. well. Yeah, and I, I, you're right. It is a very adult way of having this discussion because she's coming in with this preconceived notion. She's saying, you know, you you mentioned it actually last week. You know that there'll be accusations of the apple doesn't fall far from the tree when uh, when Chula finds out that that uh, Maya's here, and there is absolutely. Mm-hmm. She's very much like her father, and is what is what Chula's saying. And Scully's kind of gone. Well, how would you know that? You haven't seen her in twenty years. She never contacted Maya. She never visited her in New York. She never find out found out who. Maya is as a person now, but is automatically going, she's just like her father, just like William, um, involved in all those bad things, just like he was. Um, and a great response from him, again, we've, we've already mentioned him, but a great response from him going um, when, when Chula's saying, I don't want to talk to her, and he's saying, well, you don't start out by talking. You need to listen. Maybe it's a time where you sit and listen rather than coming in with that judgment, rather than coming in with those accusations about who Maya is when you don't know anything about her. Maybe you just need to sit and listen to her before you lose your granddaughter like you lost your daughter. Uh, I thought that was really, really good. Yeah. No, I, exactly. It was just superb. Yeah. Um, I, I loved how this kind of played through really. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, we'll see if she, she takes, you know, her old flames, uh, advice really. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one other little tiny connection there. We said Biscuits isn't in this episode, uh, which, you know, is a bit of a shame because I really do like Biscuits. But uh, confirmation of what happened to his PlayStation uh, is in here. Um, nobody bought it from him. Uh, he put it into the pawn shop yeah. uh, and got $100 for it, which yeah. is quite impressive for that a PlayStation 4. impressive. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Since the PlayStation 5 is out, <laughs> you'd expect uh, to get a bit less money for your uh, for your PlayStation, especially in a pawn shop. So uh, so well done. He did get some of the money up. Well, he can always uh, get yeah. it back if he goes exactly. back with the hundreds. Exactly. Yeah. So if he makes his money back, he also doesn't lose his PlayStation. That's true. That's true. Smart biscuits. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Let's go on to fight point number three. Um, we mentioned earlier on a little bit about, about Maya being captured, but really let's talk about everything that comes here from that point where uh, Maya's on her walk uh, near the lake in in uh, Tamaha, um, 
and she gets that moment of flashes from the past, from the ancestors. We saw that she can kind of call upon them uh, in the last episode where she was using the gun. She's kind of calling upon her ancestors to guide the uh, to guide her shooting and getting that connection. Yeah, but I don't here. think it's purposeful. It, mm. it, it's not something I feel she understands how it's happening yet. Not just, yet, just but because she's the expression yeah. on Maya's face when it happens, it's almost like a a shock. And mm-hmm. as you say, it brings her a skill set, mm-hmm. a, a warning, or some insight that is needed at that moment. Yeah. Um, but I don't get the sense that there's any control to it from Maya's side at mm, the moment. Not just yet. Not, not just not, yet. Not at, exactly. this, not at this very moment. But I do love this warning vision. Um, you know, as you have each of the uh, the ancestors that we've seen so far looking directly into the camera, looking directly at yeah. uh, Maya, basically, and telling her to run, telling her to get out of there, basically. Uh, I thought that was really cool. It's, it's all... a little too late yeah. because they're on her as it finishes. Exactly, exactly. But it does feel a little bit like Spidey Sense to me. It feels yeah. a little bit like uh, the Peter Tingle, as it's jokingly called in the MCU, but yeah. um, where there's a moment where she's being told something bad's about to happen. She doesn't know what it is. She's being told to run, get out of there. But well, it is, it it, is it... a little too late. But she... It just get a little warning here. Yeah, yeah well, I, and I think importantly, it's that you get the, you know, the flashes of Chaffa, uh, Loak, and Tuklo uh, here, but you get the woodpecker, which is the yes. warning. And again, maybe Maya hasn't seen that, so she's like, uh, what the hell is the woodpecker about? <laughs> exactly. As they chloroform yeah. her kind yeah. of thing. I'm yeah. guessing it was chloroform. I think or, so. Or something think like so. that to, to, yeah. to knock her out, you know? So, yeah. um, that's where I feel she's still kind of on this learning path to understand what these visions um, are. Yeah, yeah, because we saw the woodpecker back in episode one. In yeah. case you don't remember, that's when the, the woodpecker we saw land outside the house of uh, Chula's daughter, Maya's mother, um, as a warning that something was about to happen. Yeah. And that's where uh, that's where she dies and, and Maya loses her leg. So this is a, a thread that's running through the episode, not only the ancestors, but also this uh, spirit animal almost that's, yeah. uh, that's giving this guidance, giving this warning uh, to her. But uh, she is taken in by uh, the opportunist, uh, Vicky. Um, I do like uh, later on, in the episode as Henry called as Henry calls out how unusual this is the guy that cleans the bowling shoes is the guy that's turned us in and uh, almost, we almost died at his hands because he's working for me um, you know so he's <laughs> yeah. very much an opportunist here and gets his own henchwoman um, yeah and yeah. But, I mean ultimately it's not going to play out well as we'll come to but I mean mm-hmm. I, I love the fact that you know it, it seems like He's just tied up Henry because he has to, because mm-hmm. he's using his roller rink and his facilities in order to sort of do the trade after he's captured uh, Maya. Yeah. And I love that we then get the interruption of Bonnie mm-hmm. um, here. And I like how Uncle Henry is kind of warning her through sort of different signs. Brilliant. Using his, yeah. his hand really, really good. But I think what's really good here is as you know, Vicky is getting more and more agitated waiting for Zane to arrive to, mm-hmm. to sort of make this trade of the bounty for, for Maya. The, the tension ramps up here. He's kind of fidgety. He's anxious. Absolutely. This is kind of the first big thing he's done. You know, it, it's taken a, a lot of risk, uh, for him to do this and a lot of effort. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's got his, um, his gang of Grace and Brigitte, but again, it's they're nervous around Maya because they know of her reputation mm-hmm. almost. Yeah. And then Bonnie shows up. And I think you kind of get this lovely little interlude of sheer awkwardness. Um, you know, Maya didn't want to see Bonnie at all. Yeah. And she didn't want her to know that she was uh, in town. Bonnie, ironically, has arrived at Henry's to sort of understand if these rumors are true. Mm-hmm. Because why hasn't she contacted her? You know, Again, Bonnie sent the text message and received nothing back. And so you get this lovely awkwardness. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think I kind of answered one of the questions that we had talked about, you know, whether anybody had been in contact with, uh, with Maya at all while she'd been in New York. And, um, it, it sounds from what Bonnie's saying that Bonnie has always tried to stay yeah. in contact with her, has exactly. emailed her, sent letters to her, sent texts to her constantly. And Maya's the one that didn't contact her. Whereas in the other side, as we talked about a moment ago, Chula never got in contact with her granddaughter. So, uh, Maya talking about, you know, well, well you know, 
people just grow apart as as you grow up. And Bonnie's kind of going, yeah, but we didn't grow apart. You just didn't contact me. And I contacted you constantly. We saw even up to the point where her father died, Bonnie was still sending text messages to her. So that's a good 18 years with no response from Maya to Bonnie, you know, so she did try. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's sort of this awkwardness, you know, that these two, in a sense, birds of a feather, but just haven't uh, spoken to one another are captured and put in the same room. You know, everything that Maya didn't want to happen has happened. Bonnie has got her moment to mm-hmm. actually, you know, in a sense, interrogate uh, Maya about what is, has happened mm-hmm. over this, the, this period where contact has been lost. Yeah, it's not even growing apart because they've not been growing together or growing up together. Mm-hmm. They've simply um, moved apart because of a lack of contact and distance and yeah. um, despite all of Bonnie's best efforts. And I think the other side of it is then like the soundscape that they introduce into these scenes is mm. really, really good. I actually really enjoyed it because it's a bit more subtle than, say, the fight scene yeah. um, that we saw in episode one uh, because it, it's that movement of Bonnie coming in, Maya not hearing that she's come in. Yeah. She, she's, she's sort of strapped up mm. and is facing away from the door, and it, it, it's the visual cue yeah. of and the look from Maya as she realizes that Bonnie's here yeah. and then it coming into sound and then it moving back into the signing and yeah. just have that conversation and you know I thought that was really really well it done was, and yeah. I, I think that it flows through this whole piece where she's locked in this store cupboard with Bonnie mm-hmm. and she's you know using the internal window to see where I think it's Bridgette is mm-hmm. who's guarding the door. Yeah. And again, just the way the noise is then coming from the room. Because, you know, in a set, Maya doesn't know the level of noise that's happening. Well, exactly. But it absolutely adds to the tension for Vicky, yeah. Grace and Bridgette and puts them further on edge because it's like, what's she doing? You know, and yeah. it, it's a really nice sequence I find yeah. here. Yeah, I really liked it too. And, and even the moment at the start when uh, when Maya is in the roller rink and tied upside down with the glitter ball overhead, you know, it looks like a real comic book moment. It's yeah. one of those ones where it's completely impractical and practical <laughs> that she'd be tied upside down to the glitter ball. But you see her upside down, you see... um Vicky and, and, uh, Bridget and, um, Grace coming towards her in complete silence, but they're arguing already. That's what you can tell from, uh, from what's going on. So almost gives Maya an in from the start, yeah. gets her to understand that these guys aren't the best criminals in the world, gets her to understand that there is a little tension between them already. So, uh, so she can pick them apart yeah. uh, as, as the episode goes on. I thought that was a nice, a nice little added touch there. Um, and then they make their break for it. So um, very quickly, Maya gets out of uh, of being tied up. She uh, she has the um, the awesome uh, boot knife, as we've seen in many many movies yeah. now. Has <laughs> the boot knife that she uses to cut off her uh, her um, shackles, I guess. Yeah. And then releases Bonnie. They have that conversation. And then when everybody comes in to investigate the noise that Maya's making, uh, she punches Bonnie in the face, um, kind of to say. You shouldn't put the two of us in the same room together. So Bonnie is able to get out of the room while while uh, Maya's left behind to yeah. A-team the hell out of us. <laughs> I was going to say that. I had that in my notes. It was like, uh, you know, Maya A-teaming the makeshift weapon mm-hmm. um, or, or MacGyvering it. I mean, yes. you know, there's yeah. a real heavy influence, I feel, here. And whether it's conscious or not mm. of just that MacGyver A-team element here yeah. of... Um, both Maya, but also Scully being hugely resourceful, mm-hmm. um, in terms of, um, b- constructing stuff, getting out of a tight spot for, yeah. for Maya, at least. You There's know? another major character in the MCU that does that as well, which is, uh, of course, Tony Stark. That's, uh, that's how he created Iron Man, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Left in a cave on his own, uh, finds a way out of there using, uh, all the tools at his disposal, exactly like, uh, Maya here. So I love that. Even that conversation with uh, with Bonnie as she's trying to get uh, Maya's attention, she's uh, in looking through every box in the room to see what she can use. And then we get, as I said, when Bonnie's removed from the room, Maya left alone and is able to go through all the boxes to find all the ways of making this um, 
new gun for herself. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really cool. Even putting the laser, laser sight on it, uh, I thought it was really good. <laughs> yeah, well, when it hits Bridget as well, or uh-huh. Bridget or whatever, um, <laughs> you know, and she's like, oh my goodness, I've got like a sniper rifle on me. Yeah. But she just gets then hit by a load of uh, nuts. Exactly. As in the nuts and bolts variety of yeah, nuts. Exactly. Rather than an almond or a walnut. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, it, it, but it's all to create the surprise so yeah. Maya can kick her in the face. It, it's <laughs> Not really great. good. So, yeah. Yeah, that was really good. And I love that she then sends the text message photograph um, to uh, Vicky and uh, and to Grace outside, effectively yeah. telling them, hello, I'm out. <laughs> kind of <thing>. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. But yeah. shall we get on to the fight point four, which kind of leads in to this because we have the arrival of Zane and it is the roller rink rumble it has to be um, the roller rink rumble Zane and his posse effectively arrive see we um, told you Zane was going to be important um, yeah, yeah. I'm sure we'd seen him before I think we mentioned last week he was he's an actor who's been in loads of, of TV shows including Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. before uh, which is um, still a Marvel show uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to fight for that one uh, it'll be back in the MCU sh- soon I'm sure uh, but Interestingly, he's Welsh here. We have we have another yeah. another Welsh villain um, after Secret Invasion, where we had uh, Kensley Benadir playing a Welsh character uh, who was a scroll as well. Here we have a second Welsh villain exactly. in the show. What is it about Wales and the accent? Don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I always thought it was much more soft and lilty, like mm-hmm. an Irish accent. But I mean, I guess if you have, you know, a certain accent on it then yeah. it can be much harsher absolutely, so, absolutely. Uh, yeah but i mean yes zane arrives but he doesn't like being played around and here it's just like inexperience of vicky um mm-hmm. uh, as well as just i guess the evilness of zane really yeah in yeah. the end i, li- you know, I like that henry kind of set that up in his conversation with uh with vicky do you actually think you're getting one of kingspin's men here to pay you for giving them Maya back? Do you actually think that's what's going to happen? They're going to kill you. That's absolutely uh, their plan. They're coming here, taking Maya, and you're getting nothing out of this situation. And Vicky's kind of going, well, I, I'll get a higher position. I don't want to have any more orders from you any, anymore. You know, I'm like, this guy is like low level, <laughs> tried to take a shot and completely missed here. He thinks he's got a royal flush, and mm. in the end, he just has five separate cards. Exactly. You know, yeah, and that, like, that sounds like it's from experience of your public it, it is, on it, it is, it is, yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind of like, he thinks he is the kingpin, mm-hmm. at least of Tamaha. Yeah. And it's, you know, the big boys from New York are coming down, mm-hmm. and, you know, yes, they still may be relatively low on the fiscal organization, but they're higher than he is, you exactly. know? And it's like, I, I yeah, I mean, and to be honest, just the fact that in the end, you know, Vicky is betrayed by, well, Bridget has been kind of taken out by Maya because yep. of all the, the nuts to the chest and stomach. Mm-hmm. Um, Grace, and the kick to the face. And the kick to the face, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, so she's kind of knocked out yep. somewhere in, in the, the roller rink. Mm. Grace has the foresight to realize the gravity of the situation when Zane and his men come in mm-hmm. and goes, Oh, I just need to get something from the car. I need to go check something out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is exactly what I would do uh-huh. if I was even allowed. But yeah. they do let her go. You know, this is like she is not important. Yeah. Um and you know, Vicky is suddenly left there on his own. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, you know, it's the emperor with no clothes. It's suddenly his nakedness and mm-hmm. isolation is revealed. Absolutely. You know, if they had done some kind of artistic touch of having just a single spotlight on him yeah. uh, from the roller <laughs> rink, yeah. uh, it would have made sense because in the end, his death is not anything that is, um, you know, he's running for his life yeah. in his final moments. And it's actually when the lights do go down and you see Bonnie witnessing, I guess, the the violence of the organization mm-hmm. that Maya has been a part of in some ways what her life has been like. Mm-hmm. You have this gruesome sort of lolling head on, you know, of Vicky yeah. uh, with the blood stains, Absolutely. and um, I just thought it was really effective. It really, yeah. the visual of it was superb, and it, you know, it then leads into the the rumble. Yeah, yeah. W- one other thing that I do want to say: there is a moment there where Zane doesn't actually believe that Vicky's captured Maya, which I thought was quite interesting. He's kind of gone. Um, 
did he just lure us here to get the money? Because, you know, I would expect Maya to be sitting right here in the rink, uh, available to be picked up. Uh, Vicky thought he was being really smart, hiding her so he could get the money first. That didn't work out. But yeah. he sees uh, Henry uh, over in the corner and goes, well, at least if we didn't, if we don't get Maya, we've got Henry here. So uh, he's someone that they want to take out as well. Because I guess he feels that Henry could have been involved in the plot that yeah. blew up the train, uh, or blew up the ammunitions that were on the train. Uh, I guess he feels at least we've got Henry here. Um, but then the lights go out, and then the epic white noise of Rob Zombie uh, comes out to uh, disorient everybody that's in there. Uh, oh, absolutely. Cool. And what a great way to use... Again, everything you have available, you know, it's something that 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 was done uh, with great gusto in in the Daredevil Daredevil uh, TV show, where you're in an environment and they use everything in the environment as part of the fight. Here, the whole fight doesn't start out in the roller rink; it starts out in the uh, laser tag arena. Yeah, so yeah. already an arena set up for people with guns to walk around and find uh, find their enemies uh, hidden in different places. And Maya uses all that to co- completely to her advantage. She's turned out the lights. The whole place is, uh, is steeped in red with this really, really loud uh, metal song playing over the top. Regular. I yeah. love, yeah. I mean, this fight scene is great mm-hmm. because, you know, as Maya sort of wades her way through Zane's men, uh, with the power of Tuklo's aim mm-hmm. and, and, you know, the sharpshooter. Um, and I love how that flashes in yeah. to, yeah. Like she shoots guns the, at the a sounds hands. of Dragula yeah. uh, playing through. As she, yeah. as you say, she makes her way from the, the laser tag uh-huh. uh, game uh, through uh, the arcade games. Yeah. And, and through a um, wall as yeah, well. through a wall, yeah. you know, you name it. Make America Skate Again is, uh, is broken through. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I just really, really thought, and again, another superb fight sequence here. I thought this was really good. And you know what, what I liked more about it the, the second and third time I watched the episode? Um, we'd seen her fight in episode one, as we said. That was her first moment where yeah. she was uh, aligning with Kingpin's troops. And she was definitely capable uh, back then of fighting. We've seen the training that she's had, years and years of training uh, in boxing and, and, uh, and kickboxing. Um, but here you see a much more experienced fighter. Um, the way that she's throwing those punches and kicks at Zane's men looks really proficient. Like, I must say, um, Aleko Cox must have been in training for months to get these fight sequences right. She really has a strong power yeah. to her in these fights. I thought it was really well choreographed. Great job. No, definitely, definitely. And it, it doesn't harm when you literally have sharpshooter abilities. I mean, that well, moment that too, where yeah. she you know, takes three of Zane's men's out on the roller rink floor mm-hmm. with, with the handgun that she's taken off another one. Yeah. So it's that combination as well of, you know, her fighting, using her leg, mm-hmm. using the guns that she's picking up along the way and brawling as well. You know, the, the arcade uh, part of this feels much more brawly in mm-hmm. some parts of it. Um, and it, it was just really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. And I guess underlying again that Maya's not uh, a hero within the MCU. She definitely kills a couple of the guys oh, there. Oh, yeah. yeah she, it's not... she kills pretty much most of them. Mm, yeah. Um, there there are a few honest. still left at the end, but she does take out quite a few of them um, as, as she goes through yeah, but, it. But and it's definitely is... killing. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, definitely. Unlike yeah. the normal Marvel uh, TV shows where it's a punch in <laughs> the face and this they get knocked like... out and stay knocked yeah. out. She's definitely killing them. So, definitely. Yeah. But the one thing I did want to just highlight again in this fight, because we talked about it earlier on and, and talked about it a little bit last episode, she's absolutely feels like she's channeling Tuklo and the yes. abilities of Tuklo here. Definitely. So she tried it last episode when she was uh, using the shooting ability of Tuklo and, and realizing that she's getting that ancestral push through her. But it felt like a test at the end of last episode because she reacted and really surprised that it was working. Uh, this time she is using the abilities that she's seen in her visions almost. Um, so I thought that was cool. Um, she uses the gun ability and she also uses the other um, the other weapon that Tuklo uses in the flashback. It's like a, it, it's it's a, a Native American weapon which is a, uh, which is used for knocking out rabbits. I think um, so. We saw Tuklo use it to to uh, knock out a bottle uh, when she's training with her father, um, and we see Echo doing the same thing. We see Maya doing the same thing here, where she's throwing a ball at three of the guys' heads to knock them out. Yes, so, uh, yeah. so I thought that was quite cool that she's that she's channeling each of those abilities here. And I kind of hope that this is what we'll see um, when we get to the final episode of the season that she's calling on each of the abilities of her yeah, ancestors. By our powers, yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. But ultimately here, they bring out Bonnie mm. and Henry is there as well at gunpoint. Yeah. And that makes Maya stand down effectively. Exactly. Um, you know, she is there then captured by Zane, has mm. the gun to her head, but Zane is called off yes, by a is. phone call. Yeah, um, in a New York you know, minute. Who is in town, question mark? Mm. I wonder. Yeah, I think uh, I think I think we all know yeah. uh, for sure, but I think it's you know it's kind of what flows from suddenly realizing that um okay someone has called this off, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's the phone call. It's the New York minute by the Eagles is the is the um the send that Zane's got on his phone indicating yeah. this is a phone call from Kingpin. This is a phone call from New York effectively. Yeah. So the minute I heard that uh, the music playing I'm going, "Oh, okay. So Kingpin's calling uh, this to be stood down. <laughs> no, absolutely. But yeah. it is that Maya doesn't believe that it is Fisk until yeah, yeah. Henry um, reveals that he's still alive. And she's yeah. like, yeah, but I shot him in the in eye. In the face. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, w- this then, you know, you can see the terror here. Um, but the other side of it is, in this moment, even though he knows Fisk is still alive, that he takes up Maya's offer from uh, episode one to stand with her mm-hmm. in this kind of, you know, to become the queen pin, effectively. Yeah. Um, so we have Henry Black Crow Lopez standing with her to be on her side. Exactly. So, you know, that is... um the, the the notion of, of her beginning to get a, a team together as well. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. There is that team there, and it is family as well. You know, this is her uncle, and yeah. uh, and Bonnie, of course, is the one that um, they captured and stopped uh, Maya in the fight. Um, and we see the conversation with Bonnie outside, where she's saying to her, "I promise you, I will protect you. They won't be coming for you. They'll be coming for me." Um, so there's that connection yeah. there uh, with with Maya. Um, Let's move on to our final fight point, because obviously Fisk, Fisk returning is the big moment at yeah. the end of the episode, but there's a bit that leads up to it, um, where which kind of leads out of, of the Roller Rink Rumble, um, which is Maya finding her home here in, in Tamaha, um, yeah. having Henry say that he's going to support her and join with her, having Bonnie there and Maya telling her she'll protect her at all costs, that she promises to protect her. That's the family connection that we have. We also have um, Scully, her... her um, yeah, their grandmother's former partner coming in and giving her her new leg, which is another familial cl- connection here in uh, Tamaha. And really interestingly, not, not only has he provided her with this cool new leg uh, to her specifications because he's awesome, uh, he also gives her the a bit of bling. Yeah, a well. bit of bling because she's in New York. She's got to show off, right? Yeah, she's got to show that she's a, a Choctaw warrior to everybody in New York. Exactly. So he's created this panel that goes in the front of her uh, of her leg, which has the Choctaw warrior emblem, yeah. um, so that she can show off. I, I I like the little banter here between the two of them as well. Um, I do, know, and I, as yeah. well, Scully picks up around you know trying to get her to see Trula. Um, so I love the fact here that Scully not only is he you know this hugely sort of uh sort of talented kind of manufacturer in terms mm-hmm. of making this prosthetic but he's kind of that peacemaker that you know the enabler of family peace Absolutely. in a sense trying to get to talk sense into each and every one of them whilst yep. getting them to talk to one another um you know as he says we we all wish we did things differently exactly. in some cases so yeah. again it's just i love that being pulled through from his earlier discussion from Chula. Exactly. You know, he's not having a go at Chula. He's trying to just get her, trying to enable her to see past her pride, her stubbornness exactly. to speak to, um, to Maya, but also realizing that it flows both ways, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. that equally Maya needs to be sort of encouraged here. So yeah. th- this is just really good. Absolutely. And, and it does feel like those types of family separations where Maya's just going, oh, well, she wouldn't want to talk to me, you know. Um, or she didn't come and see me, you know. Yeah. It, it's that kind of almost playground. Yeah, but she um, didn't come and see me so and she discussion. wouldn't want to talk to me. That's yeah. why I'm not going to her is kind of the, is kind of the point yeah. of the conversation. So really like that. But uh, I, I do like, as uh, as um, Scully's saying, you know, you have to look good. You have to uh, show off that you're uh, a warrior in New York. Yeah. And she kind of goes, yeah, and if I don't like it, I can always pull my pants down over the top of it. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was really good. Yeah. Uh, and then we have her on a motorbike going through uh, Tamaha. And I feel there is a real connecting moment 
moment there with Maya. She's seeing uh, her former hometown where she lived uh, before she moved to New York. She's kind of getting those connections as she goes through this uh, this ride through the yeah. through the town. It feeling more a bit more like home to her. You know, as she said the whole time, she's only here on business. She was only here to do um, to do a specific mission, and yeah. then she was going to leave. And I feel like she's starting to connect back with the town as she reconnects with her family uh, who are there as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And then the final moment um, we have is Fisk returning um, right there on her property, knows exactly where she is, um, and we get this, yeah, again, wordless Fisk, I'm not saying anything to her, but I presume it was him on the phone, so I don't think the, the bullet to the face uh, caused him to lose his voice or anything. Um, I don't I don't feel like Fisk is uh, going to be entirely wordless for the show. I feel like he was the one that was on the phone to Zane, or well, maybe it was one of his... Uh, one of his it could have been Wesley's handlers. replacement. Wesley, Wesley's um, replacement, or the Wesley. replacement of the replacement for Wesley, I, I yeah. think, because I think the uh, replacement's dead as well, but... Um, but yeah, so I, I, there there is that moment, and I must say, everything is on the face of Alkila Cox here. Yeah, in, as as Maya seeing uh, seeing Wilson Fisk in her garden, she just has that absolutely fuming anger that he's there. She put a bullet in his head, thinking that's going to take the <laughs> guy out, and here he is back again in her home through the softest part of his head, through the eyeball. Mm. Yeah, know? yeah. You know, as I say, I just like this kind of feeling of this Western standoff mm-hmm. in a sense. Um, although, you know, uh, with Kingpin having a patch over his eye, it might become more pirate-like as we move <laughs> through. But, uh, so I, I just, yeah, again, great finish uh, to sort of, you know, uh, springboard it to episode four. Absolutely, absolutely. I will say, though. I know that pirates have co-opted the uh, the the eye patch, but there were definitely lots of villains and westerns that had eye patches That's as true. well. So, so I can see them taking it back for the western. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good stuff. So an intriguing end to the episode, as I say. Uh, looking forward to the fourth episode of the show and seeing uh, how the standoff uh, goes between uh, Maya and and Wilson Fisk. Uh, any other notes? Anything else we haven't mentioned on the episode, John? Uh, no, uh, don't have any notes from my side. Good stuff then. Well, with our wrap up for the episode, John, do you defend Echo Episode 3 to glow? I absolutely do. Mm. Um, I give this four and a half a glitterable gauze out of five. <laughs> um, yeah, I just really enjoyed the flow through uh, this. Uh, mm. Again, absolutely loving Scully uh, and his interaction as the, you know, the the peacemaker here, this kind of this central figure that actually everyone seems to want to come to. Yeah. Chula, Biscuits, Maya, Bonnie, yeah. you know. To steal a little bit from Spider-Man, he is the guy in the chair for, for Echo at the moment. Yeah, He's the he, one yeah, that exactly. she's going to, to to get her cool uh, new tools. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. uh, really, really enjoyed um Scully in this mm. love uh Tuklo, this this silent movie brought to life the new skill the new power mm. um that Tuklo brings to echo through these visions um again the roller rink uh rumble mm-hmm. was superb a great fight sequence i kind of thought Vicky just was played so well Absolutely. here um and his ultimate demise is kind of fitting in a way I know that sounds harsh mm. but it's just like really really good um and of course having Kingpin return and like you say that that notion that maybe uh, Maya is beginning to soften to her old hometown of Tamaha yeah. is is really good just as you know the the biggest jolt from her past arrives in there Mm -hmm. um and i i like the idea of henry uh black crow coming in now to be another part of her um sort of war against the fisk organization absolutely absolutely yeah absolutely uh four and a half glissable gauze out of five for me derek do you defend this episode of echo Yes, I absolutely do. As I said, I think this is probably my favourite um, episode so far. Again, the opening in uh, in black and white and silence, uh, like a silent movie playing out until uh, that uh, that war cry, uh, welcoming too close almost into the uh, the light horseman. I thought that was a brilliant opening, and the close on the other end of it, the brilliant roller rink rumble in the middle, but the close on the end of it as uh, Maya's travelling through Tamaha and 
it, just the underlying music underneath that. I thought it was absolutely beautiful as yeah. uh, as the the whole uh, local Choctaw people are all together singing this 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 um, amazing song as um, Maya's traveling around the city. I thought that was a really cool touch as well. Um, but overall, yeah, I think this is my favorite episode uh, of the season so far. So of course I defend it. Uh, really looking forward to the fourth episode of Echo. Yeah. Exactly. Good oh. stuff. Yeah, let's go for a drink, John. Yes, let us go to the bar quiz. Mm-hmm. Uh, fellow quizzers, fellow defenders, welcome back. We are on to question three mm. for e- the Echo Bar Quiz. So let us kick off with question three. What is the name of the arcade game that Maya gets smashed into and almost grabbed as she fights with Zane's men at Henry's roller rink? Oh, very good. Very good. A little little clue clue in the question. I like it. I like it. Um, Yes, so that's the third question in our five question uh, pub quiz or bar quiz. Uh, All you need to do is put together the answers to all five questions. Email us into feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com at the end of the season and you could be in with the chance of getting your hands on some Echo goodies. John, do you want to remind them of the question for this week episode? Certainly. Here we go. What is the name of the arcade game that Maya gets smashed into and almost grabbed as she fights with Zane's men at Henry's Roller Rink? Great stuff. If you missed any of the questions so far, they are on the previous podcasts or pop on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. Click on the pub quizzes button on the main screen and you'll get uh, the questions as they come out each week. Uh, Great stuff. Let's find out what our fellow defenders had to say. Uh, first up, we got an email in from Coffee and Vodka, who says, Greetings, fellow laser-tagging defenders. Now, this episode brought me back to the good old days. Throw in some minor cursing, a bit more blood, a compound fracture or two, and a smidge more pathos, and you'd expect to hear the Netflix tone before the title screen. Speaking of, I love the cold open and title theme. Only knowing what I do of Echo from her early appearances in Daredevil Comics, how much of her origin have they changed? A wonderful battle to Dragula, friends more or less reunited, more granny, and the return of the king pin who could ask for anything more five ball bearing blasted basic bitches sepia shaded sharpshooters and gob smacked mobsters out of five peace and take care coffee and vodka fantastic stuff coffee and vodka yeah i must say i am not entirely sure to what extent they are you know playing with adapting the the echo origins or powers or um story mm. of her origin from from daredevil at all to be honest they are changing quite a bit they are changing quite a bit the the um connection i suppose just having matt murdoch at the in the first episode that's the, the that's the connection i suppose just a kind of a reference that that echo started out in daredevil comics but um it is quite different from from the origin story and they are um connecting it much more into the choctaw nation so so this idea of the ancestral echo i guess uh bring yeah, bring on exactly. her powers not something i've uh, I've read so far in what I've read of of Echo, but again, not hugely versed in the Echo character. Uh, What we mentioned before is that um, in the comic book, she's able to echo what she's seeing in front of her, the the fighting style of other people around her, which is quite different to what we're seeing here in the show. She's uh, taking the ancestral uh, abilities and uh, transferring them to herself almost uh, at what we're seeing so far, at least. So quite, quite different, uh, but I think a really good approach if you're, if you're going to be translating this to uh, this to, to the screen for for TV, um, having those uh, connections to the Choctaw Nation, I think, has been really interesting, isn't yeah. it? No, yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Cheers. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Uh, over on our Facebook group, uh, some feedback. First up from Harvey Locus, who says, I loved, loved, loved our history lesson this episode. I'm also glad we spent another episode with the tribe. The Dracula fight scene was perfect too. Mm -hmm. They also did something you rarely see in film or television. There's a conversation between Scully and Trilla. When Scully says at the end, maybe you should listen for once, normally we would get a hard cut after that. Mm -hmm. Here they take their time to show us not only Trilla's reaction, but also her getting up and leaving the room. It's little subtle things like that that breathe life into a show and i love it very good yeah Yeah, absolutely um i i think you're so right i think there's Mm. you know these little subtle things uh and i i I think it's you know maybe in some ways it was a bit like the original daredevil that you're dealing with uh, a character who is blind in daredevil with 
echo someone who is deaf, mm -hmm. it forces you to consider how you represent that through the lens. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. wh whether it is um, blurring things or mm. whether it is through the soundscape that's happening yeah. um, or lack of it, you know, the absence, that sort of, you know, that, that hole of sound mm -hmm. and that absence of sound. And I think, um, you know, that probably, you know, gets the the juices flowing to say, well, why don't we linger on this moment? Yeah. Um, and I think that's also down to the fact that, you know, Scully and Trilla here is just so good. It um, is. Graham Greene and Tantu Cardinal mm -hmm. are just wonderful together really in good. terms of what you pick up from their expressions, their little nods and so on, their yeah. winks. And I think it's really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it's also more adult filmmaking. You know, this is yeah. a show aimed at a, at a more adult audience. This is the kind of thing you would see in a proper dramatic movie, you know, in the past comic book movies specifically going back to the 90s and, and noughties and, and up until uh, up until now, the tradition would be edit it down, fast cut it, make sure everything is like, is, barreling along at a pace yeah. don't have character moments you know having a character moment seeing chula have that reaction having her think about what's just been said to her is a much more real life uh scene than you would see Absolutely. somewhere else normally it's about just the dialogue that's being said but in filmmaking show don't tell is really important show what's happening on chula's face show that she's having that reaction we see her later on uh, when she's out with the rest of the the community, uh, everybody else is singing. Chula's still thinking about that conversation. It seems that she's yeah. had with Scully. She's still trying to make a decision as to what she'll do. And having her sitting in the middle of a room with everybody else singing around her while she's thinking is a really good choice to make for a show like this. So you can show much more about the characterization of the people that are here. Yeah, and and you know the other side of it is the layering here. You know, you have Scully who has had this conversation with Chula. He's had the the same conversation just with Maya. Mm -hmm. But we've also got now Bonnie and Maya having been sort of locked in the same store cupboard yeah. as one another and at least having some interaction. Yeah. You know, as Coffee and Vodka said, that friends almost reunited. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the layering of these different events to there possibly being some reconciliation, uh, yeah. at least at a family level, um, you know, because Chula will certainly be fine with speaking with Bonnie. And yeah. so Bonnie's perspective comes into So, uh, you know, all these connections, I think, are just layered wonderfully. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think in the same way of layering sort of the ancestral echo, as you say, with Shaffer, uh, Loak, and now Tuklo, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, I'm... Uh, totally uh, there with you, uh, Harvey. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, we also got some feedback in from Michael Booth, who says, cool opening almost feels like a link back to one division using a TV slash movie style of the past to tell the narrative and style as much as action. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, yeah. yeah, good good note. Uh, the show is moving far slower than I expected, though. Three-fifths of the way through, and so far, Maya has blown up a building and fought a bunch of guys in a bowling alley. Either the next two episodes are going to take us on an interesting, hopefully twisty journey, or I'm a little worried this show will feel like it's gone nowhere. Um, I guess time will tell on that, Michael. We haven't actually watched the other two episodes yet, yeah, so uh, so don't know just yet, but I'm really enjoying this, this yeah, yeah, uh, tale, uh, I must say. Um, although I will, I, I, I do think... It's interesting, isn't it? Because right now the big question is whether Chula and uh, and Maya are going to reconnect, or whether they'll, whether they'll be reunited. I can't see Chula approving of Maya's plan to become queen pin. <laughs> I can't no, see absolutely. that she she would be very happy with her granddaughter uh, staying in the criminal community. So uh, so I wonder how that's gonna that's gonna play out. Uh, thanks, Michael, for your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Moduline Vandenberg says. Using the prosthesis as a way to express her tribe was absolutely awesome mm -hmm. and something that really touched something in me. As a mobility age user, I try to use those to express myself, slowly making the shift from the boring aids we used in the past. Mm -hmm. Seeing her do the same was something that made me feel so seen and I absolutely loved it. As a mobility age user, not an amputee, but I still feel very represented by Maya. For disability representation, I still take everything that I can get. We don't have that much choice. I'm really loving the show so far, but this really hit close to home. Very good. Uh, thanks, Marjolene. Mm. Um, that's really, really uh, great to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is one of those things when, I mean, again, even just the banter back, because it's it's, I can imagine sort of adding something to give something so 
a medical device, mm-hmm. some personality Absolutely. or representation of the personality or something yeah. of the person who's, who who needs it and, and wears it. Yeah, yeah, it's just that's that's really cool and it's and it's great to see. You know, as we said before, representation is really really important and seeing it on screen. Um, the the way it's being presented, you know, is really really good, particularly in this show. They're doing a great job uh, overall. So, uh, really glad that you're finding uh, the the connection to this show, Marjorie. And thanks so much for your feedback. And finally, we have some feedback in from Dr. Bob Phillips, who says, I'm really enjoying the different choices of storytelling technique to drop the ancestral hero that will echo through the episode. First, we had the fantastical plane. Second, the docudrama, and this, a 50s newsreel. Add to this Punisher-level violence, the use of sound to disable, and the twist of near execution, when it looks like victory was near, was brilliant. But will Kingpin ever speak? Will Bonnie bring an ambulance to a firefight? (laughs) Who will the fourth ancestor be to help Maya out of her current pickle? And will they carry the emblem of the warrior, which now embosses Maya's leg? Very good, Dr. Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of questions. Lots of questions. Um, certainly, uh, Taloa, I think, is the name of the ancestor that will be helping mm. um, uh, Maya through um, this sort of next stage of her predicament as she continues uh, her battle with Fisk. Well, that is the name of the next episode, exactly. definitely. I'm, so it's yeah. probably Taloa. I'm being cheeky. Yeah. I, yeah. I wonder if uh, Taloa is just a really good negotiator and suddenly May will be able to talk to Fisk and talk him down and take over his position. Yeah. <laughs> well, Using the power of conversation. Absolutely. And then also bringing an ambulance to a firefight. I mean, I did actually quite like the conversation of, you know, Barney saying, we need to call the police. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, 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 because otherwise heat's on me. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I guess that's really problematic for a firefighter. Yeah. Um, there. So, uh, yeah, I kind of like Like you saw when, when she was able to get out, when she was warned off the, uh, the roller rink by Henry, she goes straight to her car and calls dispatch to try and get the police down. But is unfortunately brought back inside by Bridget or Grace. I can't yeah. actually remember which uh, which one of the two it was that brought her inside, but uh, but she was stopped. But the first thing she thinks of doing, of course, is calling the police, exactly as I would yeah. <laughs> assume. But hey, your best friend's a criminal, yeah. so uh, could it be difficult? Great stuff. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for your feedback. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Bob. We, and thanks everyone else for your feedback absolutely we do love to hear your thoughts there's still two more episodes of Echo to go so if you have any thoughts on the series you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or you can pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries there's a post up there for each of the episodes where you can leave your spoiler filled thoughts on there or you can follow us over on threads uh, as we make Twitter our X you can still find us at TV Podcast Industries over on threads Yes, and remember, you can also support TV Podcast Industries by subscribing to tvpodcastindustries.com and leaving a review on your favoured podcast catcher. Uh, Remember to share the podcast with family and friends uh, because, of course, sharing the podcast is, of course, sharing the love. Absolutely. You can also support us over on Patreon or buy me a coffee at patreon.com forward slash tvpodcastindustries or buymeacoffee.com forward slash TVPI. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us for our Echo Episode 3 podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We will be back next week with Episode 4. Taloa. Yep, fellow defenders and, of course, fellow quizzers, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Until next time, until Episode 4. Keep watching, keep listening, and, of course, keep defending. Bye. Bye. Bye.